Here we are. Benvenuti, benvenuti a tutti eh, all'ultima sessione del, di questa primavera del seminario uh, New Work on the Roman Republic. La relatrice di stasera eh, la conoscete perché ha partecipato attivamente eh, alle nostre sessioni precedenti, dando un grande contributo anche al dibattito. Si chiama Federica Lez Lazzerini che è una studiosa, um, ha avuto il suo dottorato in Classics a Oxford um, e adesso fa, svolge la sua ricerca all'interno del progetto Serica, un bellissimo progetto interdisciplinare dell'Università di Torino e di Pisa sui Sino European Religious Intersection in Central Asia, che è un progetto appunto di ampio respiro che guarda la global history sotto tutti gli aspetti metodologici e interdisciplinari. E, um, lei in particolare è una specialista una specialista, insomma, una studiosa, siamo di ampio eh, respiro sulla linguistica e la filosofia del linguaggio, con particolare attenzione all'età ellenistica e all'interno di questo suo approccio metodologico si è concentrata in particolare su, a lavorare su Varrone, studiato sotto ogni punto di vista, appunto linguistico, politico, eh, culturale, filosofico, eh, su cui ha dato numerosi contributi. Vorrei segnalare in particolare un articolo del 2017 molto innovativo sull'asilum Romoleo eh, in Varrone e alcuni lavori in corso di stampa eh, dedicati all'ars etimologica, ai modelli dell'ars etimologica eh, in Varrone e in Cicerone, uno presso il Rheinische Museum e un altro, un capitolo di ampio respiro su Varrone nel volume di prossima uscita Roman Identity. Oggi ci parlerà, appunto, ehm, ha proposto un tema molto, molto interessante e molto pertinente per questo seminario intitolato The Stories Behind Names, Etymology in Service of Roman Antiquarianism. Ma darei subito a lei la parola. Grazie Mattia, thank you and uh, so good, good afternoon everyone and thank you so much for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to, uh, to speak at this seminar. Uh, which, as you said, I've been following with great interest. So I'm going to um, share the screen. Yeah, and maybe also put it this way. Right, okay. This should work. Okay. So the topic that I'm going to be talking about today is something that I first had a chance to talk about a few months ago at a seminar at the University College of London in the frame of the uh, ERC project uh, that aims to produce the first edition of the Roman, uh, the fragments of the Roman Republic and Antiquarians. And since then I have expanded on this material and hardly re-elaborated that. And eventually this will be submitted as an article. So um, all feedback and comments and suggestions are of course highly appreciated. Um, the seminar, um, I mean, the, the, the ERC project that I mentioned is um, an expression of the revived interest in antiquarianism that we have seen in recent years. And as part of this revival, there has been much discussion and a reappraisal of what antiquarianism actually is and to what extent it differs from um, historiography or other literary genres. And this is a long standing debate and it's still very much open. But as a working definition, I'm going to talk about antiquarianism as uh, the kind of research that specifically uh, investigates ancient cultures uh, in all its various manifestations. And in fact, there's, there's a famous passage from Cicero's Academica where he praises uh, Varro for his work and his accomplishments of the, uh, with the Antiquitate Serum Ovanarum et Divinarum. Um, where he says that Varro, with that work, that antiquarian work, has revealed the age of our homeland, the various stages of its, of its history, the laws of its religious practices and of the priesthood, its civic and military institutions, the names, kinds and functions of the district, regions and places, and all the things related to religious and human affairs. And this passage, aside from being the dedication of the work to Varro and uh, obviously praising Varro, is also a list and quite a comprehensive list of the various uh, objects of antiquarian research. And recent scholarship on this subject in particular has underscored the fact that something that had not been highlighted that much in previous decades, that is that antiquarianism um, works in close partnership with language studies. 
And this is due to, on the one hand, the fact that the, the boundaries between genres are always very, uh, very fuzzy, but especially in the late Republic and especially with linguistic studies. Uh, because in this moment, in this period, as we know, grammar wasn't really well developed as a self-contained discipline and it overlapped with other genres to a considerable extent. So, for instance, a commentary on the Twelve Tables or the Carmen Saliare is just as much an exercise of textual criticism as one of religious and legal scholarship. Uh, and in fact, many authors that we will talk about as antiquarians are also known as grammarians, and the two things don't have to exclude each other. In fact, they often go hand in hand. Um, but on the other hand, this partnership is due to the fact that philological tools could be profitably put in service of antiquarian research. And in today's paper, I'm going to talk about one such philological tool, that is etymology. A testimony by uh, Gellius shows how such a use of etymology could integrate with other kinds of antiquarian research. Um, the legal historian, Servius Sulpicius Rufus, had written to Varro to inquire about the meaning of the word favisae capitulinae, which he had found in the records of the censors. And Varro, replying to him, recalled that Quintus Lotatius Catulus, who was in charge of restoring the capital after the fire of 83 BCE, uh, had wanted to make the Temple of Jupiter set out by lowering the, um, the ground in the surrounding areas, but he hadn't been able to do that because the favisae prevented that. And Varro explains that the favisae were underground chambers and reservoirs, where all statues used to be stored, which had deteriorated with time, as well as other sacred tokens given as voting offerings. And then in the same letter, Varro goes on to say that he had never found any explanation of the term favisae in literature, but the Quintus Valerius Sosora, who was a tribune of the plebs, uh, but also known as a grammarian and poet, that he used to assert that what we called by the Greek name Tesauri, the early Latins called the Flavisae, the reason being that there was deposited in them not uncoined copper and silver, but stamped and minted money. Varro's theory, therefore, was, he said, that the second letter had dropped out of the word Flavisae and that certain chambers and pits, which the attendants of the capital used for the preservation of all the sacred objects, were called favisai. Thus, Sulpicius Rufus's own research on legal antiquities was assisted by Varro's expertise on the one hand, which clarified what the favisai capitulinae were, and on the other hand, Valerius Soranus's etymological analysis, which added information on how the use of the favisai had changed over time. The derivation of favisai from flavisai and this from flata signa taco pecunia reveals that initially these chambers were used to store stamped and minted money and not uncoined copper and silver, which is that it was common to store in Tesauri in Valerius Uranus's and Sulpicius Rufus's time. So in this paper, I'm going to present some antiquarian etymologies and then analyze them first from a theoretical point of view trying to discuss what ideas can be gleaned from them uh, about names and etymology and language in general. And then the methods. And I'm going to argue that in both accounts, um, antiquarian etymologizing follows a stoic etymologizing to a great extent. And I'm going to give some considerations about why that might be the case and what this tells us about antiquarian research. So firstly, I should clarify what material I studied. Uh, as we know, antiquarian literature comes in fragments, and at the moment, there is no edition of the fragments of the Roman antiquarians uh, because its preparation is underway um, at the research team based at UCL, precisely. So until that edition is complete, uh, studying antiquarian literature remains rather impractical, um, especially because, as I said, it's difficult to separate antiquarian literature from other literary genres. Uh, because antiquarian digressions are found in a variety of other genres like textual and literary criticism, annals, historical writings, also all the kind of literature that I included under the very anachronistic uh, label of anthropological literature that includes ethnography, topography, all studies of specific areas of human culture like food, food culture, clothing, etc. Uh, but also religious literature, military, juridical, political, technical, and even philosophical literature. 
Now, for the kind of study that I propose, the ideal corpus would include uh, etymologies of names that themselves are the object of antiquarian research, given by an antiquarian author or someone who is known to have been versed in antiquarianism and in the context of an antiquarian piece of writing. However, because so little material actually survived, and also, again, because antiquarianism is so transversal, if we really wanted to abide by all three requirements, we would have maybe 10 etymologies if that. Um, but I think in consideration of how precisely transversal antiquarianism is, I think we can be flexible, especially with regards to the context. So I included in my, in my study uh, etymologies that met at least two of these requirements. And as for the time frame for the kind of authors and literature that I selected, um, I narrowed down the window to the last two centuries BCE. One, because uh, I wanted to focus on antiquarianism in the Republican period. And the reason why I selected from the second century on is not because etymology wasn't used in antiquarian literature before that, prior to that day, because we have examples of that. But because etymology began to take shape as a discipline and became particularly authoritative in the Mediterranean, following two major developments. One was that it was perfected for the sake of textual and literary criticism, and this happened, this was especially fleshed out by um, Aristophanes of Byzantium, Aristarchus of Samothrace, both of whom worked in Alexandria, and other scholars of the Mediterranean, like Cratis of Malus at Pergamum. And all three of them flourished between the third and the second century. And the second development was that Stoic philosophers made etymology a philosophical tool, as we will see in a minute. And this was, uh, this was done especially with Chrysippus, who was head of the school from the late third century. And all the, these, um, the writings and ideas of all these authors circulated widely in the Mediterranean, and they influenced the development of lexicographical studies in Rome. So that's why I selected this time frame, because from in this time frame, etymology enters a new phase, essentially. Now, based on these requirements, I obtained a corpus of some 70 odd etymologies from a variety of authors. So there are historians such as Calponius, Piso, Censorinus, or Cisenna, uh, legal historians like Junius Bracanus, Sulpicius Rufus, or Lucius Cincius, uh, literary commentators such as Silo, Cornelius, Virgilius, religious scholars such as Veranius, and then authors who span multiple genres like Varro and Ilo Silo. And talking about Varro, I should justify why I should say that I almost entirely excluded etymologies from the lingua latina for a variety of reasons that uh, we can get into later uh, if you're interested, but essentially it's because they, they deserve a completely different treatment for, for various reasons. So I just included etymologies from uh, other works. So let's begin by considering what ideas about etymologies and names can be gleaned from the etymologies that we can study. Ancient theories of etymology rested on wide ranging notions of, on the one hand, how names have come to be, and on the other hand, what names were in relation to things. And as far as we can tell, antiquarian scholars didn't really take part in these debates, but their use of etymology suggests that they subscribe to certain ideas. Firstly, the fragments commonly report phrases such as the early Latin school, or variations of the sort. Uh, for instance, Faro says that the dancers at uh, Santa Torres were named after Salius, an Acadian who first taught Romans how to dance. Then he says that the ancient Romans called the dark furbus, hence a thief was called fur because thieves steal more easily by night. Uh, or he says that ancient farmers uh, called the goddess Diana Deviana because they understood that farmers and hunters often went to the remote parts of the woods, Devii Silvae, to track bees. And then we have already seen the example with the Favisae. Valeri Serrano says that the early Latins called the Favisae Flavisae. So such phrases imply the idea that names were assigned to things by people, specifically by the Roman ancestors. And we can think that this notion follows naturally from uh, discussions or research on 
uh, objects or institutions or technologies that were developed by the Roman civilizations in its early stages. As the Roman crafted new tools for eating and drinking or began using new types of clothing or acquired new techni techniques, etc., they came up with names with these new things. And this is fairly straightforward. But this notion of human imposition also underlines comments on the names of things that wouldn't have been regarded as technological advancements, like names for natural objects, uh, like the name for the sky or for specific regions of the world or of Italy, or types of human behavior, like some examples that we have here on the slide. So this idea seems to be pervasive. Now, the idea of origin by imposition was by far the most common one in antiquity, but it wasn't the only one. Uh, for example, the philosophers of the atomistic tradition rather maintained that etymology, I'm sorry, that names had emerged through a natural process of spontaneous evolution from animal cries to more and more sophisticated articulations. Um, there's a debate whether this idea was already put forth by Democritus, but it was certainly theorized by Epicurus and famously reiterated by the creatures who wrote the Rerum Natura at a time when many of the antiquarians included in the study were already working and active. So in theory, at least in theory, they would have been exposed to this different idea. But this idea doesn't seem to be at play in the antiquarian etymologies. They all seem to talk about impositions ex nihilo. Another trait that... Another trait that we can find is that frequently uh, etymologies, antiquarian etymologies, account for the thought process behind the imposition of a certain name. And this implies the belief that names reflect the name givers' perceptions or beliefs about the things that they named. There's an eloquent passage, uh, again in Gellius, about this, uh, where he reports various discussion in the Antiquitate Serenum Divinarum <clears throat> of the names of the fates. Um, He's talking about babies being born in the seventh or eighth or 11 month of pregnancy and says, Pharaoh says the ancient Romans didn't accept similar almost unnatural rarities, but they judged that by nature, a woman gives birth in the ninth or 10th month and none other than these. And on that account, they fashioned the names for the three fates from the verb to give birth, appariendo, and from the ninth and the 10th month. And that's why we have parca, nona, and decima. Uh, another example is uh, a discussion among commentators of Navius reported by Barrow in the Lingua Latina um, about why the poet Navius in one of his lines uses the old word for elephant, that is Luca Bos, literally Luke and cow, whereas at his time elephantus was already um, circulating, was already common as a word. And three commentators, three etymologies, give three different etymologies for uh, Luca Bos that account for three different thought processes. According to a certain Cornelius, uh, the ancient Romans called the Lucae Boves such from Libya because our elephants came from Africa. Um, Virgilius gives probably the most convincing explanation. That is that the ancient Romans simply repurposed the name of the biggest horned quadruped that they had, a cow, and added the specification Lucan because they first encountered elephants in the battles against Pyrrhus in Lucania. And then Varro himself suggests that maybe the name comes from Lux Lucis because the elephants were adorned with shields that glistened from afar. So these three um, suggestions all characterize, account for three different kinds of thought processes that led to the coinage. So again, that underscores that idea. And many other examples in the, in the corpus um, attest to rest on the same idea that names reflect the uh, perceptions or opinions about things. And in addition to that, uh, there's often the implication that names also uh, convey information about the things themselves and not just the opinions that the name givers had about, about them. We already saw the example of the Fabisai. Now, if, if Quintus Lutatius Catulus thought that it was possible to lower the ground to make the temple stand out, that means that the memory of the Fabisai, there was no memory of the Fabisai at that point. So in that case, the etymology provided information which otherwise would not have been possible. Um, in Varos de Vita Populi Romani, the etymology of Tabulinum 
uh, complements the account of how ancient Romans ate in their homes. He says that, quote, in the summer they dined outside in the tabulinum, which we may gather to have been a veranda built with boards, with tabulae. So in this, in this case, the etymology provides information about what the porch looked like and what it was made of. And many other details about the, uh, the ancient Romans' daily life are drawn by Varro from the etymologies. He says that the old name for kitchen was Colina, which he derived from Colere, because the kitchen was where the ancients attended to the fire, took that care of the fire. And he says the names themselves reveal how poor and narrow the houses of the wealthy were. Also, the etymology of Torum reveals that the ancient beddings were made out of foliage, herba torta, then straw. Also, the original structure and role of certain military bodies is disclosed by the story behind their names. So skirmishers, for example, were called rorari, from rorare to sprinkle, because they threw the first jabs in battles, just like the first drops anticipate a rainstorm. So this tells us something both about the native givers' opinions, the perceptions, the impressions that they had when they looked at the skirmishers, but also of the role of the skirmishers in battles themselves. In the Rastrosticae, Barra derives from etymology plenty of information on ancient agricultural practices. For instance, the word vellus vellere, um, sorry, vellus velleris, comes from vellere. And he says that, quote, from this word, one realizes that the practice of plucking the wool precedes that of shearing it. And Sulpicius Rufus based his interpretation of the word penus as a store for food on the fact that he derived it from penitus, what is stored inside. So these are the ideas that seem to be implied by the etymologists as we can study them. And again, it must be reiterated that there's no indication that these scholars ever concerned themselves with producing a proper theorization of etymology with the notable exception of Barrow. Uh, and scholars who have suggested that a particular doctrine informed antiquarian etymologies have been, skeptical, skeptical, have been met with skepticism precisely on these grounds that antiquarian, antiquarians were pragmatic and they didn't really commit to uh, one coherent doctrine. And this may be true. However, Varro dedicated books two to four of the lingua latina to breaking down a discussion on the art of etymology, whether it was actually an art and it was useful or not. Those books are lost, but the very fact that they existed and the fact that we have some indication of their content attests to the fact that by the mid first century, when the lingua latina was published, there was discourse on the foundations of the practice of etymology and the merits of, the, of this practice and its epistemological and scientific value. So even if we assume, by lack of evidence of the contrary, uh, the most antiquarian scholars that didn't engage in this discussion and maybe didn't commit to one specific doctrine, that doesn't mean that they would have been unaware um, of the positions and trends that were defined in this climate, in, in, this, in this debate. And in fact, this particular set of ideas is the same that have been consolidated in the tradition of one philosophical system in particular, that was Stoicism. And nowadays, the Stoics' interest in etymology is well known. Uh, Chrysippus wrote seven books on etymology, presumably studying it from a theoretical point of view, and four books of etymologies. And these books are now lost. Uh, but many etymologies have been transmitted in his name. And the sheer number of etymologies uh, credited to him and to a lesser extent to other Stoic uh, philosophers is indication of the favor that this practice enjoyed among the acolytes of this school. And the reason for this ultimately derives from the Stoic cosmological and ethical view that everything in the universe was permeated and guided by a providential divine principle, the logos or nature which was considered the repository of truth, logic, uh, wisdom, and virtue. And like other Hellenistic schools, the Stoics dedicated ample attention to reconstructing the development of the human civilizations. And the early and middle Stoicism attributed the attainment of technological and cultural achievements to the fact that the early humans were exceptionally wise, which enabled them to be more attuned with nature 
than their descendants. This will change in later Stoicism, but it's, it's typical of early and middle Stoicism. And one of these developments was language, which Chrysippus consistently implies to have happened through imposition ex nihilo, at a time when he assumed that people were more capable of grasping the true nature of things than the following generations would be. From this follows the value of etymology for the school, because it enables so philosophers to recover the ancient name givers opinions about things, which was considered an almost perfect rendition of the true nature of things. Now, all of this we know now, but there's indication that it was already known in antiquity. In particular, there's a passage from Cicero's De Natura De Orum, uh, where the character of Cotta, who is relating uh, Cicero's own academic views on theology, criticizes Stoic theology. And at one point he targets Stoic etymologizing and the fact that the Stoic, the faith that the Stoics uh, placed in it. He objects to the Stoics um, rationalizing mythological figments as if they held a true philosophical value. And he mocks their etymologies of the names of the gods. Saturnus is so-called because he's stated with yes, Marvors because he subverts the great, Minerva because she minishes, or because she is minatory, Venus because she visits all things, Ceres from Berry. What a dangerous practice. With a great many names, you will be in difficulties. What will we make of a Jovis or Vulcan? Though, since you think the name Neptune comes from Nare to swim, there will be no name of which you could not make the derivation clear by altering one letter. And we should put a pin in that because it will become relevant again later. So this testimony shows that the knowledge that the Stoics had a penchant for etymology and that they credited wise name givers for the imposition of names that capture the true nature of things was already common in the mid first century. So if this particular set of ideas could already at that time be traced back to a well-identifiable tradition, then I would argue that we are justified to frame the theory or rather these theoretical bits if we don't want to really call this a theory for the antiquarians, but then we should place them uh, in a line of filiation from the Stoic approach. And the Stoic matrix, I think is suggested even more strongly when we shift our attention from the theory or the ideas about names and etymology to the methods that the Stoics, um, sorry, the antiquarians uh, use. So the ratio etymologica, the principles according to which they actually derive their reconstructions. If we think about the etymologies that we saw earlier, the rationality seems to be plain and simple. The idea is that the etymologized word and the derivation have to share some sounds. They have to have some sounds in common. And in principle, this is not far from the principles of modern etymology, with the difference that modern etymology aims to identify regular sound changes and to isolate roots and differentiate them from grammatical morphemes, whereas antiquarian etymologies, in antiquarian etymologies as we, as we can see them, the selection of the sounds that has to be mapped out onto different words seems to be completely arbitrary. And the way in which those same sounds are rearranged in the derivation uh, is also completely discretional. Also, uh, it's inconsistent and not explained. So instead, words are treated like strings of letters, all related to one another equally, that can be manipulated at will. So some, some sound syllables, sounds or syllables, are dropped, like from furbus to fur, from faunus to fana, from lepus to lepus, and from terima to turma. Uh, other sounds or syllables are added, like from carua to carsitani, from initiae or indeutiam to undutiae, and from carere to carimoniam. Some are exchanged, like seb in sebestai becomes sabini, naucus becomes nakka, but tebai becomes tebai with the aspiration. And some words are presumed to have originated from multiple stems collapsing into one. So pilumnus comes, comes from pelle remala, sacellum from sacra kella, and volpes from volare pedibus. Also, we can notice that often the derivation that is suggested hinges on very few sounds that are in common, 
if we can notice how few sounds actually bind together Luca Boss with Libiki, and Silo has to bend over backwards to find some words that he can map out onto some of the sounds of Nuskitiosus suffering from night blindness. Another trait that seems to be characteristic is that often an intermediary form is posited to bridge the gap between the word and its etymology, like lateroneirio ammonia terima. This is often unattested elsewhere and apparently made up to justify the semantic connection that otherwise wouldn't hold up phonologically. Also, the sound changes that are postulated are often not explained, but at best merely acknowledged. For example, um, Varro explains how we get from Terima to Turma by saying simply that E turned into U. Or uh, the etymology of Favisa was a Valerius Serranus, but if you remember, it was Varro who had given the linguistic justification. And he has said that the second letter has simply dropped out the word Flavisa. And also to justify how we get to terriones to triones, he just says by elimination of the E. Now, of course, we have to be cautious and keep in mind that we are dealing with fragments after all. So it's always risky to make claims about an author's intention where we don't have the full text at our disposition. We don't know to what extent the citing source uh, manipulated or paraphrased or cut the original text. So it is possible that the original text of the antiquarians did provide um, justifications. That being said, um, it's also true that many of these fragments are quoted by grammarians and often quoted for linguistic interest. So I find it difficult to think that a citing source would have failed to report a linguistic justification if it had been present. But of course, there's no smoking gun here, so uh, cautiousness is uh, imperative. And finally, the changes that are suggested, the sound changes that are suggested, are not consistent. The antiquarians suggest different uh, results for um, different phonetic changes in similar phonetic contexts. Like for silo, mol becomes sometimes molucru, mol in molucrum, and sometimes becomes mil in militas. Uh, for sensius, the diphthong au becomes sometimes just a simple a, like in fana, or sometimes it becomes uh, with the redoubling of the next consonant, Nahus to Nakka. And Varro suggests three different changes to the, to the syllable ter. Sometimes it becomes tur, sometimes it becomes tr, and sometimes just t. Now, to be fair, there are some etymologies that are sensible in this corpus. Uh, Silo, of course, is right to derive molucrum from mola, or really Sibylus from molare. And it's true that vindicia comes from vindicare, sponsa comes from spondere, and quaesto comes from quaerere. However, most of these are fairly self-evident. Um, not always so. Uh, for example, the etymology of nuptiae from obnugere, because it was customary to veil the bride in ancient times. Uh, this is ingenious and it's not discredited by um, modern etymology. But overall, the method is quite inconsistent. Uh, it's also not. It, it's also true that not all antiquarians were equal when it came to their linguistic sensitivity. Nevertheless, clumsy reconstructions, such as the ones that we saw, are found to a greater or lesser extent in antiquarian literature across the board. Even in the one who was arguably the most competent one of all from a linguistic point of view, that was Varro. Um, and to be fair. Varro's linguistic uh, awareness and sensitivity was far more advanced than many of his contemporaries, and his etymologies, by and large, tend to be better than his contemporaries, especially those of the lingua latina, often do pass the tests of modern philology. Also, he was better than many of his contemporaries at identifying regular sound changes like rotacism uh, or dissimulation. But even he often fell into the same traps as we saw. Now, if we look at Stoic etymologies, we will see that some of the flaws that distinct that, that characterize antiquarian etymologies are exactly the same. Words being treated like strings of letters that can be manipulated at will, and all the others that we saw. 
uh, like in Chrysippus, Lupe, Lupe from Lucis, the Phaedolos from Feuge in Todunai, and others. Uh, the last four that I reported are from are given in um, Cicero's passage from De Natura Deorum. So these are etymologies that he either took from an unnamed Stoic uh, source who was writing in Latin, or maybe that he reconstructed himself based on the uh, Stoic method. Um, but it's also, these are also the same flaws that we find in etymologies prior to the Stoics, like in Plato's etymology, for example. I just reported three examples from the Catilus, and these are also the same flaws that tend to characterize etymologies prior to Plato, the so-called traditional etymologies, the ones given from um, the most ancient times, the ones given by the poets uh, or, <clears throat> or the pre-Socratics and so on. But if this is true, so if, if indeed all these flaws actually characterize a variety of etymologies from different traditions, then what grounds are there to claim a stoic, uh, specifically stoic influence on antiquarian etymology from the methodological point of view? And in fact, some scholars have dismissed this possibility precisely on these grounds, that it's not just in the stoics that we find these kind of flaws. However, to start with, there are actually a couple of features that seem to be distinctively uh, stoic of the stoic approach, namely the postulation of an inter intermediary form that, as we saw, is quite frequent in antiquarian etymology and is also frequently done by uh, Chrysippus, for example, didasco coming from diasco or ancon from encon. And this is not as frequent in uh, other etymologies. Uh, it seems to be really something that was typical of Chrysippus. Um, but uh, also, uh, also the fact of not explaining, uh, the, of acknowledging or describing the, the, the phonological change, but not explaining it. Like again, in the case of Didasco, Chrysippo specifically is quoted as specifically saying uh, that we get from Diasco to Didasco by insertion of the delta. So he just describes the change, but he doesn't explain it. Again, also with the Stoics, we only have fragments, so we have to be cautious, but again, these fragments are often quoted for linguistic interest. So it would be, it would seem strange to have just not reported the linguistic justification if Chrysippus had given a linguistic justification. Crucially, however, the fact is that this was not the only etymological approach that was around in antiquity. And it's not like the method of traditional etymologizing was never challenged. In fact, after Plato, uh, shed light on etymologies and uh, studied it critically and gave a variety, um, a great number of etymologies with this method, some criticism was developed. Uh, Aristotle in the Poetics had analyzed the way in which names could be made up of different parts. And when he was explaining Homeric Greek, he elaborated a model according to which these parts could change. Uh, Homeric name, names could be an extended or shortened or altered version of the Attic Greek equivalent. In these derivations, the sounds that are removed or added to the etymolog uh, etymologized word are suffixes that can actually be isolated as separate constituents, and the unity of the stem is recognized and preserved. In the Interpretatione, Aristotle states that um, that a name only has proper meaning when all of its parts is, is combined, are combined, and that individual parts cannot be separated arbitrarily. And this has been taken by some commentators as direct criticism against Socrates. Nevertheless, after Aristotle, the Stoics uh, took up the same method and they popularized it. And Cicero's passage that we saw earlier shows that further criticism to this approach had been advanced after the Stoics popularized it. And furthermore, after the Stoics popularized his method, uh, or at the same time, indeed, alternative approaches had been developed or alternative ideas about etymology. This happened firstly by uh, text-based grammar, as it was, as it was uh, developed in the second century uh, BCE, second century scholarship. Uh, in particular, Aristarchus of Samothrace elaborated what is arguably the most advanced etymological method in antiquity. And that includes 
well until late antiquity, well until uh, in Isidore, for example. He also uh, divide, divided words into different parts, reminiscent of the Aristotelic lesson, but his segmentation, his word segmentation is done in a way that is, um, that shows that he was aware of it, that he recognized lexical and grammatical morphemes. Also, he recognized regular sound changes, and most notably, he applied his method consistently. Aristarchus's Homeric editions and his etymologies circulated widely in the major cultural hubs of the Mediterranean. And crucially, we know that they were known in Rome, not only because the entire practice of textual criticism in Rome was modeled after the Mediterranean, but especially Alexandrian and Pergamenian approaches. And anyone who was trained in grammar, and we have seen that antiquarians often were also trained in grammar, were trained according to those traditions. But also we know that Stilo person, personally, um, meaning he actually uh, knew the work of Aristarchus. He is credited with having um, introduced in Rome the system of diacritic science that was developed by Aristarchus. So he must have known his work quite closely. He must have come across his etymologies. Varro definitely knew Aristarchus. He uh, quotes him, he mentions him in the Lingua Latina and his entire, in the Lingua Latina, especially the morphological section uh, is ostensibly uh, modeled after, well, it draws a lot on Alexandrian scholarship. So these scholars and probably other antiquarian scholars trading grammar would have come across Aristarchus's etymologies too. They could have seen a different method at play. And the, in the generation after Aristarchus, as we know, grammar continued to be developed as a discipline of its own. And uh, I mean, not just based on textual work. And some scholars proposed theories that may be only concerned etymology tangentially, but they were bound to affect how etymology was done. They show in particular an awareness of the fact that words are built out of lexical roots, and these roots must remain integral in all of the words derivation. For example, Philoxenus theorized that the entire Greek lexicon derived from monosyllabic roots, which could be reconstructed through analogy. Now, from the etymological point of view, his results were not always perfect. He often came up with etymology that don't hold up. But at least in principle, the method is correct. The idea of trying to, um, to go back to the root. And again, he applied this method consistently. Uh, a certain Cosconius in Rome seemed to be doing a similar thing. He is cited by Varro as having theorized that the entire Latin lexicon came up and uh, all boiled down to a handful of primigenia verba, and that by combining these primigenia verba with prefix, prefixes and suffixes, the Latin lexicon was, uh, was created. And we know that Varro knew of Cosconius because he's the one who cites him. In fact, the little that we know about Cosconius, we know because of Varro. And there are grounds to assume that also Philoxenus was known to some antiquarian scholars training grammar. They shared a lot of interest, and some of Philoxenus's works presumably influenced some of Varro's or Stylo's um, works. So the point is, if there were other methods, arguably superior methods from, from a linguistic point of view, that were that circulated, that were available, and at least in principle, they were accessible to antiquarian scholars, then why was it the Stoic approach that prevailed and became canonical in Roman antiquarianism? Was this unintentional? Did the antiquarian simply fail to appreciate the fact that there was a difference between different ways of manipulating the letters of a word? Or was it a more or less conscious choice? I don't have a conclusive answer to this, uh, but I have some considerations on both sides and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about this. So some things suggest that there was in fact just a lack of understanding, that some of the antiquarians simply didn't realize that, um, that there were different methods and uh, or different values to the way of, uh, again, manipulating the words. There's a passage from, um, from 
from Varus de Lingua Latina from book six, just be before he uh, begins to give etymologies of names that have to do with times, where he cites his authorities, his sources. And he says, for this subject, I have a sufficient authorities, Chrysippus, Antipater, and those endowed with, if not equal insightfulness, at least more erudition, among whom are Aristophanes and Apollodorus. All of them write that words are derived from other words in such a way that some words take others loose and others change letters. Now, what Var is saying is not incorrect, uh, but the thing is, uh, Chrysippus and the Alexandrians were removing or changing or swapping letters in very different ways. Uh, Chrysippus was doing it arbitrarily, and the latter, uh, the Alexandrians, were doing it respecting morphological boundaries. And from this passage, it's not clear whether Varro realized that there were different um, values to this, different levels of correctness. He does say that the uh, Alexandrians had less, um, were less insightful, but more erudite. So perhaps this could suggest that he appreciated the fact that they were better from a linguistic point of view, but it's really not clear from this passage. If indeed there was a lack of understanding that not all ways of manipulating a word were equally valid, I suspect that a significant role was played by the rhetorica de Renium, or rather the way in which it was interpreted. It is by now established that the rhetorica de Renium uh, was a foundational text and for Roman grammar, and it played a crucial role uh, to the development of grammar in first century Rome even though in itself it's a treatise on rhetoric and not on grammar, but it was an important link in the chain. Now, there's a passage in the Rhetorica de Renium where the, the author describes the rhetorical figure of paronomasia. That is a process by which a word is changed into a word of a, a different meaning by only a slight phonological alteration. And he lists six types of paronomastic change. Um, that there can be the contraction of two of two letters or the change of quantity of a sound um, or the addition, subtraction, inversion or replacement of letters. And it has been noticed that this model essentially expands on Aristotle's threefold model that we saw earlier. And the thing is that this model applies both to words that are etymological, etymologically related to one another and words that are not like the change between temperare and obtemperare is also etymological, but navus and vanus have nothing to do with one another etymologically. And this is not a fault of the treatise. The treatise is about rhetoric and paronomasia remains a rhetorical figure, even when it has to do, when it applies to words that are not etymologically related. The problem is if one assumes that all kinds of paronomastic change are also etymological when they are not. So if Roman linguists and antiquarians were building on the rhetorica de Renium and misunderstood the purpose of this model, that would explain the confusion. On the other hand, there's also a case to be made that the antiquarians could have had reasons to feel more compelled towards adopting the historic approach. As I argued above, I think tracing this approach back to the Stoics would have been natural in this moment, in this, at this point in time. And perhaps the very authority of such a source factored into their preference for this method. Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that all the antiquarians were Stoics. There's no reason to say that. Uh, we know that Stilo professed to be a Stoic, but for one, Sophaeus was an Epicurean. And the same may have been true for Aurelius Apillus. And Varro's philosophical views are just too complex to be reduced to just one authority, even just for etymology. So I'm not suggesting that. However, there is some common ground between Stoicism and Roman Antiquarianism. The Stoics were the only philosophical school to have, as it were, canonized etymology as an epizegetical and even epistemological tool. And this brought them close to the antiquarians who, as we saw, used etymology as a heuristic tool. Um, also, unlike scholars such as Aristarchus, who essentially concerned himself with textual work 
and Philoxenus, who studied grammar as a subject of its own. The Stoics had high expectations of etymology to reveal information which they deemed uh, philosophically valuable. And the antiquarians had similarly high stakes because they trusted etymology to deliver information about the Roman past. Also, Stoicism shared the interest in exploring the past, which defined antiquarianism. Now, on this topic, we should note that an interest in the distant past was not exclusive to Stoicism either. Accounts of the development of the human civilizations are found also in Epicurean literature, but also non-philosophical literature. However, in Stoicism specifically, this interest in prehistory took the form of idealization, because as we saw, they presented the early humans as wiser and more virtuous individuals whose enlightened ways of life were corrupted by their inferior descendants. By contrast, Epicurean prehistories rather emphasize the progress that has been made uh, since the primitive stages. Now, the nostalgic yearning for a happier past was thought to be more pure, resonated a lot with the Roman ethos, which, as we know, often framed its calls to virtues uh, within narratives of historical decline and paired them with lamentations for the loss of the, the Mos Maiorum. And this is no mystery. We know that that's one of the reasons why Stoicism appealed to certain Roman intellectuals. But if this sentiment played a part in leading the antiquarians to embrace the Stoic theory and methods of etymology, then perhaps it also informed or even biased the way in which they approached the study of antiquity. And this is just a further element which might have influenced the adoption of the etymological approach. Perhaps the superiority of other methods from a philological standpoint didn't strike some antiquarians as a decisive factor because they prioritize other outcomes of etymological research over accurate linguistic analysis. In short, a method that is based on the arbitrary manipulation of letters and abides by very few constraints leaves a lot of leeway for a scholar to put forth the etymological explanation that, for whatever reason, is more congenial to them. And sometimes this can be as harmless as accommodating one's personal perceptions about a thing's most salient traits. Uh, for example, Silo's etymologies of Lepus and Volpes both single out the animal's speed as their most salient traits. Or uh, Veranius' etymology of uh, Offendix, the band that fastens the apex, uh, the apex um, highlights the, the tactile aspect of wearing this cap. But other times, personal interpretations could affect a scholar's analysis in more significant ways and confirm preconceived notions or actively promote certain narratives. For example, Sophanius' etymology of Latium from Latere, because in ancient times, the Latins dwelled in caves to shelter themselves from wild animals and the elements. Well, this underscores the perils that humans had to deal with in pre-societal times. Or Sincius, with his etymology of Thana, gives Faunus exceptional prominence among ancient deities, among others. Varro's etymology of uh, Panda from Panem Dare implies that the Romans welcomed the refugees who fled to the asylum at the Porta Pandana and cared for them. And essentially all the etymologies from the Vita Populi Romani create a picture of Roman life, ancient Roman life, as humble and sober where the people slept in beddings made out of foliage, and even the wealthy lived in poor and narrow houses. And we saw that the antiquarians used etymology as a research tool. So accordingly, if we assess these etymologies as research outcomes, what they show is at best confirmation bias. And in some cases, even deliberate manipulation of data. Because well, sometimes we see that etymology is being used to support uh, narratives or interpretations of history that are completely fabricated, leading to the so-called antiquary inventions. Varro is particularly guilty of this. Uh, he uses etymology a lot to flesh out the importance of the Sabines in Roman history, sometimes beyond historical accuracy, and to emphasize their role as makers of Roman cultures. So for example, he states that the Aventine uh, was named after a river 
that flowed in the Sabino. There were other etymologies at the time, but he chooses this one. Or he claims that Enotrius, the eponymous king of Enotria, was a Sabine, whereas Dionysius of Halicarnassus says that he was uh, an Arcadian. Also, he uses etymology to link the Sabines with traits and concepts that were connected to virtue and sobriety, again, to promote a certain characterization of his people. So he derives Sabini from Sebesai to be pious or religious, and he claims that ancient, the ancient term Tebai, which is otherwise unattested, was still used by the Sabines to call hills, and this would be a vestige of the sober, rustic lifestyle of the early, of the early Romans. So etymology was used not just to reconstruct history, but also sometimes to manipulate that. To conclude, Stoic etymologizing informs antiquarian etymologizing to a significant extent. I think this is unambiguous with regards to the theory of etymology. And I think it's possible for the methods of etymology and there's room for discussion. Uh, whether the Stoic approach was consciously preferred over others, even though they were more accurate linguistically superior, or something prevented the antiquarians from appreciating the different values of different methods. But at any rate, this influence tells us something about antiquarian research in general, because it indicates that the approach that found favor among these scholars was one that tapped into a sentiment of nostalgia for ancient times, which were assumed to have been better, and allowed room for personal views and agendas to influence the research outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Grazie davvero. Bellissimo, bellissimo uh, seminario. Troppo difettiamo gli applausi sonori. Bene, c'è tantissima carne al fuoco, tantissime cose da dire. Eh, grazie anche per aver mostrato la complessità eh, teoretica che c'è dietro, molte etimologie che a noi sembrano semplici, tendenzialmente noi consideriamo le etimologie del mondo antico molto banali se non sono fatte con motivi linguistici, addirittura le chiamiamo etimologie popolari, invece quelle che per mm. noi sono etimologie popolari per loro forse erano le più raffinate, perché non erano linguistiche ma erano <ride> filosofiche e direi anche politiche. Evidentemente. Ci, ci sono domande? Qualcuno vuole intervenire? C'è lo spazio al dibattito. Mentre magari pensano, io ti faccio io una domanda ehm, sull'ultima questione che hai toccato, del successo dello stoicismo. Potrebbe esserci secondo te una correlazione tra il successo dello stoicismo in politica e il successo dello stoicismo anche nell'antiquarianismo? Cioè alla fine molti politici, è vero che è forse un po' più tardo questo, ma molti politici sono comunque di, di, di ideale stoico. Nel dibattito politico lo stoicismo aveva già, già in età graccana un grande, un grande appeal. Potrebbe esserci una correlazione? Il successo dello stoicismo in politica e nell'antiquarianismo? Mm. L'antiquarianismo? Mm. Io credo di sì. Um, Uh, if you prefer English, if you prefer to answer in English, no problem. Um, eh? we, whichever, uh, all right then, okay, I'll, I'll switch to English. Um, I think there can be a relation between the success of Stoicism in politics and in antiquarianism, although this depends on how we define antiquarianism. Mm. Um, according to the ancient, in well, not ancient, but the, the previous interpretative model of antiquarianism, the one that had been uh, promoted by Momigliano, mm. um, Well, he defined antiquarianism in opposition with historiography, and he said, among other things, that historiography often was linked to political motives, whereas antiquarianism was not. It was just there to satisfy a scholar's love for erudition. Um, and this has been, um, scholars have backtracked from that considerably. So they have actually underscored that antiquarianism could also have a political mot motive. So if we accept this view, then, then yes, then uh, the, the success of Stoicism in politics could also be, uh, be linked to the success in antiquarianism, because again, antiquarianism could also be used to promote certain, um, certain political takes. Do you know whether that answers the question? Yes, yes. absolutely. Uh, I see a question from Federico. 
Thank you. And again, it's a question on the possible reasons for the success of stoic etymology. Um, do you think it might have anything to do with the fact that it is, at least on the face of it, um, fairly easily teachable? You know, it seems to, it seems to follow a, a set of fairly intelligible principles that one can acquire with, you know, a suitable amount of application that, uh, that can then be sort of reproduced fairly, fairly straightforwardly and therefore, you know, would enable one in, to, to buy into an established, uh, well, uh, cultural intellectual discourse. Yes, I think I think that's that's a very good point. Uh, it's it's very easy to teach this because there's very little to teach. I mean, there are very few principles. The, the idea is just you you do whatever you want. Um, but I think that is actually raises an, another important point. It's interesting because one of the main one of the main points in the discussions about the artist or the technai was uh, whether an art was founded on principles that could be explained and taught or not. I mean, we know that this was one of the major um, requirements that were uh, that the um, philosophers objected rhetoric to, uh, or in general, the technai, they were often held accountable um, to that standard, whether they were founded on principles that could be explained and taught. And since Varro actually dedicated these books, which we don't have, uh, to breaking down the discussion about whether etymology is an ars and is useful, then it's interesting. It sounds like something. The absence. It sounds like the, the absence of specific principles would have been highlighted. Would have come to light. Um, it would have received some attention. I think yes. This is a, a more easy, uh, an easier approach. I want to say approach and not method because it's not really a method. It's just again very free, loose manipulation of, of letters as if they were all related to one another equally. This is certainly very easy to teach. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. Uh, well, I saw uh, a question from Roman probably, but... Uh, mm. uh, okay, it's, yes, it was a question, very, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for a fascinating paper. Um, I was wondering whether we could make some comparisons with the, with the, with the modern situation, with the situation today, uh, because when we observe more interest of the wider public circles in uh, the questions of history, etymology and so on, we probably see something similar today in terms of uh, what kind of methods, but now within the wider public, would be more accessible, and, and especially etymology as well, uh, would be more um, successful just because uh, they provide all the um, things you mentioned, the wide range of possibilities, the possibility to, ch to choose whatever the, you, you want to prove uh, by using this kind of etymology. So in short, the question is whether any comparisons with the modern situation might be helpful. Of course, not in proving anything, but maybe in looking for the ways where to look in the ancient evidence for the answer to the question of why the Stoics' etymology uh, was more successful. Thank you. So if I understood correctly, um, you mean that, I mean, nowadays situation, the circumstances nowadays show how history can be manipulated, and reconstruction can be um, again be manipulated, and this probably explains it, why um, the possibility of doing that was of interest in, in that time. Did I did I understand that correctly? I, I mean that uh, also today we have some um, uh, I would say approaches or uh, like quasi uh, uh, scientific, so to speak approaches to etymology as well. And they're quite successful uh, for a variety of reasons. I was just wondering whether the investigation into the reasons for which today we have that kind of interest in what we would not call uh, 
uh, real uh, etymology. So, so the, the, the reasons for why it is today uh, quite uh, popular maybe I don't know, maybe suggestive for understanding for um, at least look for, for, for understanding where to look into the ancient evidence. I, this is the question. I don't know if, if, if it may be a, um, helpful in any way, that, that kind of comparisons. Uh, well, I, I admit I don't know of modern different approaches to etymology that stray from the standard neogrammarian hypothesis. So, um, I don't, so I don't know about that. In general, I think it's always possible to draw parallels from different, from different moments to see the common patterns. So in general, I think there is a lot in nowadays situation that can shed light on um, understanding the patterns or mechanics of what happened in other times than in, in late Republican Rome and vice versa. So as a general, so in general, I would say yes, as a general method, it's always useful and to uh, this comparison can always shed light on one period or the other. I admit, I don't know about specifically these different, different approaches to etymologies nowadays that are not looking for regular sound changes in regular phonological patterns. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Roman. Um, Harriet, please. Thank you so much, Federica. I really enjoyed your paper. And um, obviously, any mention of the rhetoric at Arrhenium is welcome. Um, and, um, but not just that, I, I think there's one thing that I would like you to um, say a little bit more about, because I was thinking about the relationships there. You talked at the end about how possible ways in which to explain the Stoic uh, success in, in terms of etymological thinking influencing the antiquarians related to a nostalgia for the past. And I'm just wondering, in what sense is it like the Romans had a nostalgia for the past and therefore etymology in and of itself was helpful or desired, or was it that you were thinking that Stoicism or Stoic theories had an element of nostalgia built into it that appealed to the Romans. I'm just wondering about the relationships there uh, around this nostalgia idea. Mm, absolutely. So yes, in general, etymology doesn't necessarily have to rest on, on a sentiment of nostalgia. Again, if you just take it as a research tool to learn about the past, then it just teaches you something about the past. You don't need to commit to a certain sentiment. We know that that was a sentiment that was often uh, again felt by certain members of the Roman elite, especially in the time. Uh, and we also know that that is one of the reasons why some of them, why stoicism appealed to some of them. The thing is, um, with stoicism in particular, the attention for the past, which again is not specific to stoicism. There's also the Epicureans, also uh, right in. Um, delving to prehistory, but with Stoicism especially, the idea is that the past was better. So I'm just wondering if the Roman antiquarians were also uh, sensitive to or receptive, maybe receptive to this sentiment of nostalgia and uh, lamentations for the loss of the Mos Maiorum, which was better and more pure. And we know that some of them were, because for example, Varro obviously, obviously was. Then, then it might be interesting that they felt particularly compelled towards specifically stoic etymologizing. And I think it might shed some light on the way in which they did research into the past. So to just circle back, etymology can just be useful to do research into the past. You don't need to think that the past is better, but if you're doing etymology in the way, according to the methods that people who thought that the past was better were doing it, that maybe does influence the way that you do research into the past. Just trying to, to simplify. I don't know whether that answered your question. That's really helpful. Thank you, Federica. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other question, observation, remarks? <laughs> 
Well, uh, may I ask a very technical question? Oh, sorry, sorry, John. I see now. John. Great, thank you. Yeah, very enjoyable talk. I, I wonder, maybe leading off your, your last comment there with the relating the etymology to political aims, if you were, how you would connect that desire by a lot of elite Roman families to associate themselves with Trojan heroes and using some etymology in order to connect their names. So the obvious, most famous one would be the Julius Julius, of course, but you know we know of other, you know, a few dozen of these Trojan families. So I wonder if you see anything in there. Oh, absolutely. I would uh, just straightforwardly rank those uh, instances among the list of deliberate manipulation of data by means of of language. And uh, just I, I, as you said, we have plenty of examples of uh, families who wanted to advertise a specific genealogy, sometimes even an ethnic identity. We have examples of families um, claiming for themselves a Sabine origin after Cato made it popular to be, to be um, after Cato popularized the positive stereotype for the Sabines, for, for families who had nothing to do with the Sabines, and also to the Trojans, and, and not just that. Uh, again, to go back to Plato, whom I didn't include in the study because he predated those, uh, those stages that I, that I talked about, but he does this a lot, and it's very, it's very interesting. Um, in, in the case of the Italic peoples, he claims that the Marrucini and the Marsi uh, actually were related to one another, eth um, their names etymologically and therefore also ethnically. And this is to this is um, this aims to exclude uh, any foreign origin to the Italic peoples. So through one etymology, you can even give peoples an ethnic identity where, where it was unattested uh, previously. And again, Varro, by claiming that Enotrius was uh, the, the, uh, the eponymous king of Enotria, was a Sabine, he's essentially connecting the Sabines to the Arcado Pelagians, obviously with all the positive traits that come with them. So I think this, this falls precisely into, into that kind of more or less conscious or deliberate manipulation of data. And I think etymology, especially the kind of etymology that you that allows you to just manipulate words as freely as you wish, uh, is a great advantage, advantage and a great tool at your disposal to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, Jackie Elliott, please. Hi, uh, I also wanted to thank you very much for uh, a really great talk. Um, I wanted to go back to Henriette's question about the nostalgia and just with an observation. So uh, my interest in this topic comes from a project that I'm doing investigating sort of the transmission history of Cato's Origenes. So obviously a text in which mm. there are uh, lots of etymologies in and, in and of themselves that we can still see nowadays. But I think what I'm seeing about the transmission is that so much of it, you know, wherever we find it in the sources, uh, stems to a collection, a sort of pre uh collection of etymology. Perhaps, you know, I mean, we know he had his text, De Obscuris Catonis, um, and so on. Um, and it just occurs to me just that it, it, it really um, supports your idea um, about um, the importance of nostalgia in connection with etymologizing, the fact that you have this well-established figure, Cato, to whom so much of Roman nostalgia was uh, connected, where it was rooted. Um, you know, it's, it's just an observation, but, you know, thank you very much for your talk. I, I really uh, appreciate it. I, I was also at your earlier talk on the same topic and uh, they were both great, so thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I added, I added some some things and I also backtracked on on some things that I that I said in that talk like again maybe wasn't so straightforward that they actually realized that other methods were better but they just chose stoicism I yeah I want I have a more cautious approach now and say well maybe they actually didn't understand but uh it's it's really helpful what what you say um uh, about Cato again I didn't include his etymologies here because it was too ancient but I think I mean, the phenomenon doesn't change that much. And what we learn from uh, 
uh, from Cato or uh, indeed Fabio Spector, who did something similar with the Volscians, claiming that they came from the, the, the sequeli, uh, I think can shed light on, again, how etymology could be used. And thank you so much for, uh, for, for letting me know about this. Yeah, I mean, I think what I mean to say is that it's not so much Cato's etymologies, which we can't tell a lot about because they are so veiled in, you know, the 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 sources and, and their interests. It's just that um, uh, it's very hard. It, it, it's very hard to get out of the antiquarian tradition when you're trying to find out about Cato's origines. I mean, there are with mm -hmm. other texts. Um, that I've looked at, there are other kinds of interests in, 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 in texts of, of that age, of that era. But with Cato, it really is like there was this, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of flourishing of scholarship in this one moment. And I think it's very early, you know, I think it looks like Berius is already copying out his Cato from previous, uh, from previous uh, scholarship that he had access to. And then you know, that's what then issues in all manner of, you know, commentary on Virgil and all other kinds of scholarship really across, across that transmission. But so there's this just this one moment of interest. And, mm -hmm. and, and of course, it has to be connected with nostalgia at that moment, you know, in sort of by the end of the Republic. So, okay, again, thank Great. you. Very much. And that's just really helpful. Um, thank you. Thank you to both. Uh, Ariette. Sorry to come back again, but this sounds to me You're welcome. interesting <laughs> um, to think about the different moments of flourishing of, of interest in antiquarianism, but also perhaps in particular works that seem to be picked up more. And, and this is a question out of ignorance, Federica, so just tell me, oh, of course, or not at all. But I wonder how far these antiquarians are taking authority, not just from um, trying to show, okay, this word must derive from X, Y, Z, but to say, as someone has already said, like Cato has already said, and therefore we must trust it, or you know, other people that are seen as authorities, how far do they use these kinds of examples, historical examples to support their etymological conclusions or suggestions? You mean the citing sources or the antiquarians that are cited? Um, those antiquarians who, are, are they citing authorities for their readings is what I'm thinking. Right. So in the fragments that I looked at, it's, it's almost never the case, as in we have one source saying, as Varro says, or as Aurelius Ophelo says, or as Stylo says, and it's almost never a case. I think, yeah, the, the, the one example that comes to mind is again the Flavisae, where we have Gellius quoting Varro, who quoted Valerius Soranus. But usually they just quote the antiquarians. But of course, they are fragments. So it's entirely possible that they just didn't want to, um, to add to report the extra layer of the antiquarian is also citing someone. And it's also very is also very possible. They could have been citing someone else because in one thing, I think Momiyano was very right uh, in about antiquarianism. Antiquarianism rests on solid scholarship and research and erudition. So you have to have, have, have had access to other sources. Um, but I think, yeah, the, this will be really interesting to, to find out, but I don't know whether we can ever actually find out to what extent this was their genuine material and to what extent they were citing others because the sources don't quote that but maybe they just weren't quoting that okay jackie please um sorry just very quickly to contribute to that i mean one one thing that i'm seeing is that cato right for in in some areas he counts very much like if you cite cato then you know that's the end of the story um but when, when, when he comes up in this kind of context, um, he's just an antiquarian among other antiquarians. And even someone like Servius doesn't really care that it's Cato. Um, and he'll only even name the fact that it's Cato if he's arguing against someone else. 
um, and he just wants to add more firepower. But then it's the same, you know, he's the same as Livy, he's the same as, you know, he doesn't have special authority. So I, I just, that's one of the things I'm struck by. Mm, yeah, it's true. Also Gelli, also Gelli sometimes. Uh, again, the passage from the etymology of Penus from Penitus, so the store for food from inside, that he quotes from Servius Sulpicius, he only says that because he's talking about uh, Skyvolas, Skyvolas, I don't know how to say that in English, uh, his other etymology, and then he says, but actually Servius Sulpicius disagrees with him, and then he gives the correct etymology. But maybe otherwise he would not even have quoted Servius Sulpicius Rufus, if not for the fact that he was actually arguing against uh, Skyvola. Well, uh, other question, remarks? That's a very stimulating debate. Well, uh, if we have if we have still some some minute, a few minutes uh, um, of room, uh, may I ask you a very technical question? In one of the first slide, uh, you showed a list of sources, of ancient sources for etymologies, isn't it? Uh, I'm just gonna share that again. Well, no, it's, not, it's not so necessary. I think, Wait, which one? Uh, I don't remember. Uh, oh, what, what, what yeah, are the is, do, you, do you consider these authors are like sources, no, for Varros or um, or not? These are the antiquarians. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. He uh, he quotes Stylo and again Serranus. So he quotes some of them. Yes, but some I of them were also his contemporaries. My question was: I was wondering, do do you think that antiquarians, and especially, give to epigraphic sources a different? Uh, he, did he conceive epigraphic sources, ancient inscriptions, like uh, a different source, like like we do, uh, different and in some cases more authoritative or not, uh, or this is only a modern approach? Well, this is interesting. He doesn't seem to consider them that much at all. Mm. That is. Um, Obviously, I could the, I could just not know some texts, but in the lingua latina, I can't think of a single single example where he quotes uh, inscriptions. And well, the other works are fragmentary, apart from the Rerum uh, Sicarum. There might be okay. I might not. I might be misremembering, and maybe there are some examples, but I don't think he considers them differently. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they did scholarship on the 12 tables, so that would count. But we don't know uh, to what extent they considered them different kinds of, uh, of scholarship, unfortunately, because it's all in fragments and the fragments don't account for that. Well, I have the same feeling, I think. Um, so thank you for confirming that. Thank you. Okay, other? Well, what do you think? Can um, finish, or if you have still some, Federico, would you like to say to speak? Or well, I think uh, if there aren't other questions, we should just thank Federico very, very warmly. Uh, yeah, a very, very brilliant very paper. And, well, very, very um, thank you all for tuning in and for and for the discussion, which uh, as ever was uh, very. Thank you for the all the contributions. That was yeah. really helpful. Thank you, everyone. Bene. Mm -hmm. Questo era, era l'ultimo incontro di questa serie primaverile eh, del nostro seminario che conclude un pochino, chiude il cerchio di una serie di incontri che abbiamo visto sulla Repubblica Romana che hanno coinvolto tantissimi aspetti metodologici. Questo secondo me forse è la cosa più interessante da sottolineare. Abbiamo visto veramente tantissimi approcci, tra cui quello di oggi particolarmente originale, ehm, che fanno vedere quanto gli studi sulla Repubblica Romana siano tuttora fertili, anzi, mostrano un'ascesa una notevole anche rispetto a una generazione fa eh, sul, sul modo di ristudiare questo periodo storico. Insomma, credo che sia, si possa dire che sia stato veramente piacevole e importante mettere insieme un numero ampio di persone eh, con vari aspetti, vari, vari approcci tematici e metodologici che si confrontano su un periodo storico, di, di lungo respiro ovviamente. Benissimo, non credo che possiamo veramente, diciamo dire, 
per oggi chiudere e poi eventualmente ragionare su eventuali futuri sviluppi oppure no. <ride> Io vi ringrazio tutti, ringrazio tutti i partecipanti, tutte le partecipanti che hanno contribuito al dibattito in una maniera veramente, veramente piacevole e veramente proficua, credo facendo avanzare gli studi, come diceva un noto maestro, no? Importante il progresso della disciplina. È una fascinante idea, ma sono ancora molto happily committed to it. Uh, grazie, Mattia. Um, well, thank, thank you, everyone. Uh, and, um, well, happy Easter. Happy Easter break, if you're on your Easter break. And uh, uh, till soon, in, in some form and in some forum. Uh, and thanks again to Federica for a wonderful talk. Good day. Okay. Stop.